E a hate hau e wawara mai, e ti ue rā ki nāna i a pai te pūpū tara ki ki uta i tiki mai atu te au. Te kotu o i a te pau, te pau whakai roka tū ki wai te mata i o ku wai rangi e kākiri. A tūtao mai i runga, tūtao mai i raro, tūtao mai i roto, tūtao mai i waho. A kia tau ai te mauri tū, te mauri ora ki te katoa. He mauri atu, mauri mai, mauri ora, tūturu whakamau ai ki a teina, teina. Haumi a e hui e, tāe ki e. A e tū ake au ki te mihi atu ki a koutau. Ko ai ake nau e tū ake, ko au te kaitaka wainga Māori o te wānanga aronui o tāme ki makaurau. Ko wirimu tīpona taku ingoa. Nō reira, ki a koutou, a mātou te whānau o te wānanga rōnu i tāmi ki makaurau, nau mai, piki mai, kake mai, haere mai. He tino harikoa hau, he tūake nei ki te mihi atu ki a koutou. He tino harikoa mātou a te whānau o te wānanga nei, AUT University, hei tuku mihi, hei tuku mihi whakawhetei, hei tuku mihi whānau i ki a koutou, hei tuku mihi aroha ki a koutou. Hei tuku mihi māhana ki a koutou, hei whakamāhana i a koutou wawata, i a koutou ngākau, i a koutou ōranga katoa. Ngā whānau tai mai nei o ngā hau e whā o te ao nei. Harikoa mātou, kua tai mai nei, hei toha toha i a koutou whakāro i wainganu i a tātou i rotu i tēnei hui ngā atou. Nō reira, ki ngā rangatira e tai mai nei i tēnei ata, i tēnei rā, Ngā mihi nui atu ki a koutou. Tēnā rau atu koutou, hāra mai, hei toha toha kōrero i wainga nui a tātou. Te whānau ki ko nei, hei tai mai ki te awhi nei i te tautoko tēnei kōrero. Nō reira, aha koe toru toru aku nei kupu, ka nui te mihi. Ka nui te hari kō tōku ngākau, ka nui te mihi. Kia kaha, kia toa, kia maia, kia manawa nui. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou katoa. A tēnei wāhara mai i taku whānau, hei awhina mai i rotu i tēnei waiata. Kia ora. Te aroha, te whakapono, me te rangi mari e tātou, tātou e. Te aroha, te whakapono, me te rangi mari e tātou, tātou e. The words of that waiata talk about the love, the truth, and the passion that we want to welcome you in. Nō reira ngā whānau, o ngā hau e whānau mai, piki mai, kake mai, hara mai, i rotu i a mātou, aroha, kia ora. Kia ora whānau. Kia ora tātou, and the warm Pacific greetings. I'm David Roby from the Pacific Media Centre, and welcome to Aotearoa and AT University for what I'm sure will be a lively and stimulating conference on political media issues confronting the Asia-Pacific region. Many of you have travelled uh, from far and wide to be with us here these few days and my fellow organising uh, committee members are thrilled by seeing so many of you here and I know more are coming from uh, Jira and Sydney um, uh, today as well. We have, um, we have journalists that are, uh, from Antara News Agency of Indonesia and from the Bangkok Bureau of TV Asahi, and we have movers and shakers of the media industry and journalism educational fields from Fiji, Timor Leste, and uh, West Papua. We have uh, Pacific visionary uh, Walter Fraser, who will be uh, shortly be opening our, our conference. Um, we also have a contingent of seven media educators from the Danish School of uh, Media and Journalism and the Swedish School of Social Sciences at the University of Helsinki here with us today. Thank you. Um, but the biggest thrill um, is seeing so many of the co-editors and columnists, research authors, photojournalists and cartoonists uh, who have contributed over the years to build up Pacific Journalism Review from scratch to come here and help celebrate our 20th um, birthday. 
Um, some 27 contributors have been able to make the journey, uh, as I mentioned, some of them are still, still to come, um, among the many registrations that we, ha we have. I think this is quite astounding uh, since this conference actually grew like Topsy. Our original idea was to have an evening event with filmmaker Max Stahl, who's uh, with us and will be speaking on uh, Friday evening, uh, from, and he's from Timor Leste as our special guest. But no, um, the organising committee said, and that's, that's not enough. We, we have to mark 20 years of publishing with a conference. And so here we are. Um, however, this momentous time for us is also tinged with sadness. Two of our colleagues, including one of our keynote speakers, have had to leave suddenly due to uh, family bereavements. In the case of investigative uh, journalist, the Cesc Arena uh, Gillon from the uh, Philippines, um, and, and she, who, among other inquiries, has been probing the scandalous and Patuan massacre political fallout in the Philippines, suffered the loss of her sister uh, and, uh, a couple of nights ago, and she returned to uh, Manila. Um, and then one of our own colleagues here at AUT, um, Karaya Rahman, she lost her father and has had to return to Malaysia. So our condolences to both uh, Cess and Karaya and their, their families. You're going to hear a lot about Pacific Journalism Review and various aspects during this conference, so my comments about the journal here are brief. Um, as founding editor, perhaps I can be excused for being rather biased, um, but I do believe that PHR has quite a unique um, character. It is more than just a research journal. It's given strong support to investigative journalism, photojournalism and political cartooning, um, as you see out in the foyer there, uh, in, this, in this past two decades which is reflected in the character of the magazine. It's been truly a critical conscience of society. Now, a few quick words of thanks to our organising uh, committee, Barry, Philip, Jim, Alison and Roxana. And I'd particularly like to thank Tui O'Sullivan uh, for special support in our preparations and also cartoonist Malcolm Evans, uh, who has uh, supported the journal for a few years and donated um, political cartoon books in your uh, conference bags and it's uh, Malkin's um, e exhibitions out there, both in digital and, uh, and print forms. Um, so, and there's also an Auckland City Library display out, uh, that will be um, here uh, for part of the conference and a, uh, part of the events of the conference are actually going to be at Auckland uh, Library tomorrow. And, and also a PGR display up in the AET Library. But most of all, I'm indebted to Del Absadi and her niece, um, Venus, for their tireless efforts over the la last several, several weeks. And now Dell has stepped into the breach left by Sis uh, Dillon to give us a special Empatuan summary this morning. So Dell, thanks, thanks very much. Um, especially, you know, pulling this together at uh, such short notice with um, the Empatuan presentation. Now, before I introduce our guest speaker to open the conference, a few housekeeping uh, issues. The bathrooms are to my right, just, just along on this level, but also straight across up the steps and then round to the, to the left. Also, in the unlikely event uh, of fire or other emergency uh, in this wonderful Sir Paul Reeves building, the outside assembly point is up the stairs, the same stairs as the toilets, and then it's out through the main entrance into the um, hospitality plaza out there. Um, now, it's my pleasure, my real pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, to open the conference. Walter Fraser, um, who was appointed uh, AUT's uh, Head of Pacific Advancement, uh, Pacific Advancement, Pacific Advancement, and have to, because there was a name change uh, earlier this year, uh, early, um, and, and he, he, he joined us from the uh, University of Auckland. Now, AUT has the highest number of tertiary Pacific students in New Zealand, uh, studying health, information technology, and Pacific uh, business studies. Plus, Pacific students are a key part of the largest communication uh, studies program right here in New Zealand. Um, Walter joined AET from our rival across the road, um, the University of Auckland, where he was director of the Centre for Pacific Studies. And at, at the point of actually joining us, he was the director of Pacific Strategy and Engagement. So it's great to have uh, Walter with us. He was previously registrar of the University of the South Pacific in Fiji, where we first uh, crossed paths. So I was really pleased to sneak in quick uh, and invite Walter to um, open this conference before he even got to AUT. 
Um, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, please give a big hand uh, for Walter Fraser. Morning everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Professor Tony Clear, who's here in this capacity as um, Associate Dean Research for the Faculty of uh, Design and Creative Industries and uh, for, the, for the Faculty of Design and Creative Industries. But Tony, I understand you're also here representing um, Professor Desna Juru, who's our Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor and Dean. Um, Adam McConaughey, who is here from the Asia New Zealand Foundation. Adam, thank you for your generous support of this conference. Distinguished keynote speakers, members of JIRA, Jeans, and Pima, our overseas visitors and distinguished guests. I'm delighted to be here and to see so many new, fa so, so many familiar faces, including former colleagues and friends from my time at the University of Auckland and the University of the South Pacific. On behalf of our Vice Chancellor, Derek McCormick, I'd like to extend our warm Pacific greetings and welcome to New Zealand for our overseas visitors, to Auckland, the largest Polynesian city in the world, and to AUT University. It is also my great pleasure to welcome you all to, to the Political Journalism in Asia Pacific Conference. As we all know, this conference also marks the 20th anniversary of the Pacific Journalism Review. Early this, earlier this year, I was listening to a local radio station as I was stuck in traffic, as one normally is in Auckland, and the radio announcer said that the 40th anniversary special edition of John Lennon's Imagine had just been released, and he began to play it. As the song played, it triggered clear memories for me of a distinct moment in history, as though it was only yesterday. I'm sure we all have those moments. For some, it might have been when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. For others, it might have been when humankind landed on the moon, or when the Berlin Wall came down. Most of us will remember where we were when the World Trade Center was attacked. For Professor Roby and some others here, it might have been the moment they held their very first issue of the Pacific Journalism Review in their hands. For me, John Lennon's Imagine always takes me back to May 14, 1987. I was driving my white Suzuki Vitara up Motu to a road in, in, in Samoa, and it was a little after 12 in the afternoon. An old friend of mine, Ulafala Ayavau, who was a radio journalist at the time for Radio 2AP in Samoa, had just interrupted the airwaves with news that there had been a military coup in Fiji. I distinctly remember pulling up to the side of the road next to RPA's Anglican Church in utter shock. I still cl clearly remember Fala's tone of voice. He, played Len he sounded like he was reading a funeral notice. When he finished, he played Lennon's Imagine and dedicated it to the people of Fiji. I had heard and hummed that song hundreds of times before then, but never really paid attention to the lyrics as I did that hot, sunny afternoon in Apia. In more ways than one, the political events in Fiji since that fateful day have had a profound effect on political journalism in the Pacific. Many of my contemporaries who worked as journalists in Fiji at the time paid dearly for defending the fourth estate. They were unified in their views and they vehemently defended the right to call things as they saw it. A spade was a spade, black was black, and white was white. Similarly, the political upheaval of 2000 with George Spade found a new generation of journalists many of whom were Professor Robbie's journalism students at the University of the South Pacific, again risking their lives to ensure that we all received news. Again, unified in reporting the events as they saw it, striving to be impartial, as it were. By this time, I was working here in Auckland, and I remember logging in keenly to read regular internet updates from those students. Unlike in 1987, this time, we were not limited to print or broadcast, we also had the internet. Not long after, I returned to work in Fiji as registrar for the University of South Pacific. I was there in 2006 when the Bani Marama coup occurred. Unlike previous upheavals, this time the mediums for the disbursement of information was vastly different. We now had a much wider range of digital platforms, blog sites, Facebook, Twitter, and the like. 
through which a myriad of views could be expressed easily and speedily, and with relative lack of censorship and or ethical or professional standards. In his address, delivered as the Andrew Alde 2010 lecture, British journalist and editor of The Guardian, Alan Rusbridger said, and I quote, virtually every adult over the age of 30 grew up with the idea that the fourth estate consisted of just two parts, press and broadcasting. Each was owned, financed, and regulated in different ways, and each gave rise to different ideas of what journalism was. There was much to cherish in the balances and tensions inherent in this duopoly. A reader or viewer could measure the message of one medium against the other. There was a tent peg of attempted impartiality by which to measure the wild west of the printed word. But now there's a new kid on the block. You could even argue there are two new kids on the block. The original World Wide Web, essentially another form of transmission, and Web 2.0 the advent and rapid maturing of so-called social or open media. No one owns the digital space and it is barely regulated. It brings with it an entirely new idea of what journalism is. Indeed, for some, it calls into question whether there is such distinct thing as journalism. This double revolution within just over 20 years is having a dramatic effect on the accepted norms and characterizations of information. We are seeing the splintering of the fourth estate. A close quote. In terms of the Pacific, in my view, this splintering has been manifested in the numerous rival regional groupings that have emerged in the recent past, and the tensions that frequently call into question their own ability to remain impartial and ethical. I see from the program of the conference that there will be many sessions that will allow a fullest discussion and debate of some of these issues. This backdrop, despite the bias of my Fijian lens, resonates well with any tribute that one might pay to the Pacific Journalism Review. Over the last 20 years, the journal has successfully positioned itself as a quality publication where those committed to the development and advancement of the Pacific Island region can find a platform to, to debate Pacific media issues. I first met David when I went to USB, as he said, at the beginning of 2001 and attended an event to celebrate the success of the Aussie Awards at the, at the Aussie Awards of those very same students who reported on the 2000 Fiji coup. Now I find myself at an event where we are not only paying tribute to 20 years of the Pacific Journalism Review, but we also celebrate yet more of these students winning Aussie Awards, but this time for their coverage of Fiji's democratic elections. There is a fortuitous and beautiful poetic serendipity and synergy in the timing of all of this and the threads of issues and topics that have been interwoven throughout the program of this conference certainly reflect the rich and colorful tapestry that is the Pacific Journalism Review. I warmly congratulate those involved with the Pacific Journalism Review on your 20th anniversary, and I wish you, the conference speakers and attendees, all the very best for the productive and inspiring three days here at AUT. It is now my privilege and great honor to declare the political journalism in the Asia-Pacific Conference open. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sasia and I'm a recent, very recent, graduate of the Bachelor of Communication Studies here at AUT. I majored in video production under television and screen production. And earlier this year, each of us in the major created a short documentary for a client. My client was David. And my brief was to create a video to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Pacific Journalism Review. Creating the short documentary came with its challenges. This was an international story. As you'll see, we did interviews with, uh, via Skype with Lee Duffield and Wendy Bacon, who are based in Australia. Another challenge was creating a documentary, a visual medium, about a publication, something that isn't typically visual by nature. Fortunately, the Pacific Journalism Review has vibrant, sorry, vibrant visual features in its history, such as political cartoons by Campion Ohasio and Malcolm Evans. The short documentary about PJR has come to mean a lot to me. Once again, I'd like to thank all those who gave up their time and resources for the doco. I'm very grateful for all your help. Thank you. In making this video, I learned just how passionate everyone who is involved with PJR is. 
I hope this short documentary does justice to the time, energy and heart that has been put into the journal by all those involved.
um, where we were going to have um, Fess talking to us about her uh, investigation. This, this has actually not happened because of course she's had to leave and she's being replaced. Uh, this is a double replacement by Dell. Um, now officially it says here Dell is an advocate for the Auckland-based Asia Pacific Human Rights Coalition and the Philippine Migrant Centre including editing and Filipina and Toknot newsletters and she's also the designer for Pacific Journalism Review. I'd like to add, having known Dell and David for many years, that Dell also plays another extraordinarily vital role in all of this. Dell is the person who very occasionally manages to persuade David to go home and sleep and eat. <laughs> and for that we should thank her. Okay, the session we're going to be looking at of course is talking about the situation following the uh, massacre of um, journalists in the Philippines about eight years ago and the consequent struggles to bring that to justice and the consequent situation where we now face a danger where um, this may all be lost but I think it would be more appropriate at this point now to hand over to Dell to speak about that. Hello everybody, I'm sorry I'm not Seth, I'm just <laughs> filling in. Uh, this is all about Ampatuan Massacre and this is the fifth anniversary. Uh, Seth would have um, given you more insights into this because she worked as a journalist in this issue. But of course we can get some information from the internet. So if I miss out on some things, forgive me. <laughs> I'm just filling in the gap. Uh, first of all, I'm going to read the message from Cess. Greetings from Manila. I arrived home an hour and a half ago. There was a delay in the Hong Kong Manila connection. My sister passed away last night, New Zealand time. Just a few hours before I was to take my flight back home from Christ Church. My family awaited my arrival before the cremation of my sister, which will be tomorrow, which is today, or a few hours from now after 6 a.m. Mass, Philippine time. Tomorrow is the only service, and the wake will be until 12 midnight, and the burial is the following day. I thank you, Rebecca and David Dovey, for your understanding and compassion. Thank you for kindness and understanding, says. So that says a lot, and that explains too why I am here. Uh, we we did not we decided we did not want to leave a gap. So um, I just put together some information about the massacre, in the hope that, uh, that you will get a little bit about it, which I think everybody knows. Uh, the issue about the Ampatuan massacre, where. 58 people were massacred on the 23rd of uh, November 2009 and 32 of them are journalists. So there you are. That's why there's the interest of this issue. Uh, where's the... Ah, so I'm sorry. Okay, first the background. Uh, for probably an additional information. Oh, I haven't touched it yet. I got it. Yeah, okay. The Ampatuan family is a very famous or notorious family in the southern part of the Philippines, Mindanao. Mindanao, for uh, your information, is the second biggest island in the Philippines. The biggest is Luzon. Uh, Mindanao is actually uh, mainly uh, Muslim, uh, there's a big Muslim population there, but there were also there are also Christian population, and um, I should uh, compare it with West Papua, where the transmigration was heavily encouraged uh, long before this uh, incident happened, because um, earlier on uh, this island was mostly Muslims, and because of the transmigration, it created a lot of problems. Anyway, the Ampatuan family, family is a dynasty. And believe it or not, up until now, they are very, very 
uh, powerful in that area. And whoever challenges them will have the fate of the 23rd of November 2009. Um, the godfather, Andal Sr., has been the governor since 1998, which they call the reign of terror. And uh, there was an agreement, uh, well, soft agreement, between the president of the Philippines then, Gloria Arroyo, and the Ampatuan clan that nobody is going to challenge him in that position. And luckily, or luckily, uh, one uh, who's got the courage to challenge him, Mga Tutu, uh, Manga the Tut, it's hard to pronounce, sorry, <laughs> uh, challenged him in that election. And so there was the convoy going to the uh, com Comlec or Commission on Elections to register. And that's uh, along the way that incident happened. But of course, because it happened, uh, everything broke loose. And so the challenger won in that election. However, before that happened, um, there was the presidential election, and 69% of the vote in that area was given to uh, Gloria Arroyo because of that secret deal that they will uh, support her as long as they will, uh, the, well, the president will also support them. So it's like scratching each other's back. Well, one year after, still the people are, uh, were terrorized. There was no, uh, well, justice at the time. And of course, uh, with that very big incident, uh, I think the biggest uh, atrocities in one day uh, of all the journalists killed there must be the biggest in the world. 32 killed in one day, 32 journalists killed in one day. Um, can we play this? How did I? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh no, sorry, can <laughs> play that? Ah yes, thank you. These are the slides of photographs that will tell you what the people uh, around the Philippines did during the first anniversary of the massacre. Some areas um, planted trees to commemorate the event. The event. <laughs> uh, some did rallies. Uh, some gathered together. That's a big rally. Uh, that goes to show that there was an outrage everywhere. Not only in that area, but all over uh, the Philippines. Also, uh, it sent, that incident sent a chilling uh, effect on all journalists because, well, apart from the fact that there was a history of uh, killings uh, and every year how many were killed in the line of duty or out of duty, uh, but nobody was held into account. So, uh, in other words, there's a culture of impunity. Right, Shabu. Right. Um, can we play, please? Darkness yeah. is no comfort for Jesse. Now in hiding and not Jesse is one of the witnesses, key witnesses. frightening to him as death, but that he wants to tell his story because he fears he's a dead man either way. I had to run because I heard that they were going to kill me because of what I knew. Andal Ampatuan Jr., also known as Datu Unsai, is the man Jesse says put a 45,000 U.S. dollar bounty on his head, despite being in police custody. Unsai is a member of a powerful political clan from the country's south with close ties to President Roya Arroyo, but he's now being held in Manila, facing charges of multiple murder. 
Hun Sai is accused of being behind this, a massacre that took place last November in his home province. At least 57 people were killed, including some 20 members of a rival clan, journalists, and passers-by. Jesse says he was one of the gunmen with Hun Sai, that he worked for Hun Sai's cousin and had no choice. He claims there were several other Ampatuan clan members who took part in the killings, and that they were acting not on Hun Sai's orders, but on his father's, the clan patriarch, former governor of the province. I was there when they met a week prior and talked about the killings. Hun Sai only does what is told by Andal Senior. I followed orders too. I fired shots. I don't know how many I did. If I had them, well, we know what Hun Sai is like. The Ampatuans maintain their innocence, and so far only Unsai has actually faced a judge. Other members of the Ampatuan clan, although taken into custody, have yet to be brought to Manila. They are now likely to be tried along with 180 others. Unsai and his defense lawyers usually sat right here. Now the case against him has been brought to court and is being seen as the biggest test not just of the nation's judiciary, but democracy as a whole. Due to security concerns, a special court was even put up here, inside National Police Headquarters. But the hall is empty now, as because of pending motions filed by the defense, the trial has been suspended indefinitely. We know that our justice system has been, is less than perfect. In fact, there's so many loopholes, it tends to be politicized, it, and, and these are weak institutions. But court authorities say they are doing the best they can given the circumstances. Any accusations that there is political pressure to ensure the case fails are unfounded. The transparency that the court has been showing is a proof that uh, uh, there, there, there can be no collusion, there can be no uh, uh, agreements between uh, the prosecution and uh, the defense. Okay, sad to say, he was saying that, but in reality, it's the reverse. Because up until now, there was no justice. And uh, right after that interview, Jesse, who, is the key, who was the key witness, was gunned down at 8 p.m. on the 14th of June, 2010. So goodbye to the key witness. Right, next one. We've got three years after. C can we play for? Ooh, okay. Can we play that one? It is said that the mountains of Magindanao hold many secrets, but there were new ones it couldn't keep for long. More than 50 bodies were recovered here after being massacred on Monday in broad daylight. Bullet ridden and mutilated, many were female members of the political Mahundatatu family and their supporters. The rest were journalists. Allegedly behind the bold attack is a powerful rival family with close ties to the current administration. The Amatuans. Well, we can say that they are probably the last of the Babylonians. Speaking exclusively to Al Jazeera, this man claims he was working for the primary suspect, Andal Ampatuan Jr. Ampatuan Jr. denies any involvement in the killings. Dato Andal himself said, he told us, that any and all of the Mangu the Dato clan, even women and children, should be killed. We don't ask why, we just follow orders. The boy says he had no choice, that he was present at the massacre, but couldn't participate. He didn't stop it either. He lived with an Ampatuan's feet down, and it's just the way things are. But it's exactly that long-standing cycle of fear and violence that the grieving Ismail Mahmoud says he wants to break. His wife and over 20 other relatives died while on their way to filing his candidacy papers against Ampatuan Jr. in next year's provincial polls. I am decided to run for governor, and no one can compel me not to run for governor because I want to reform. Three days later than their Muslim tradition dictates, the Maladudatus are finally able to put their loved ones to rest, and they have vowed not to avenge the deaths. Instead, they hope their loss will mean the region's other secrets can no longer remain buried. The lawlessness, they say, that's only whispered about, the proliferation of illegal weapons, and the impunity with which crimes are committed. For many of the residents here in the Philippines' troubled south, death has become a way of life 
and power is equal to the number of guns you own. They feel there's a desperate need for change, but that the only way to do that is to have a complete overhaul of the political culture. And the problem is, they don't think any of the nation's leaders are up to that challenge. My conscience can't take it. That innocent civilians were killed. It's too much. The horns of those ampetuans should be cut off. All of them are evil. Those people are demons. They kill without mercy. In nearby wars, bystanders file past the numerous other victims as the nation continues to remain in shock at the brazen murders. Every action the government takes now is being closely scrutinized by its opponents. Elections are coming up, and critics wonder if the administration can truly bring about justice and possibly have to turn against one of their own or find a way to whitewash what's being called an unprecedented national nightmare. Mark Ortigas, Al Jazeera, Magindana, Southern Philippines. Uh, there are two things that I want to emphasize here. Uh, some of the people, uh, family members of those um, murdered, were actually uh, being terrorized. One, uh, which is uh, the wife of uh, Mina Reblando, the wife of one of those uh, killed, uh, she has to uh, go to Hong Kong and stay there because she was very um, scared of her life. And the other one, uh, the mother of Catherine Nunez, the well, uh, the, camera, um, the mother of the slain cameraman, Victor nu Nunez, uh, she was uh, being, uh, there was a s sort of like a surveillance. She, is be she was being uh, followed or something by at least four men aboard two motorcycles and was going around the neighborhood and uh, asking her whereabouts. Uh, I just want to say that these are the kinds of tactics that they do so that the witnesses or the families will stop and zip their mouths and call a case closed. So that's how they, uh, well, that's how powerful this clan is uh, up until now, uh, four years after. It's just saying how, well, disgusted probably is very soft to say, but uh, people, especially the families, are in a way really feeling so angry and hopeless for no justice uh, af even after four years. Okay. It's very difficult because it's in our language. There's no uh, translation there. Mm, can we go to the next one, please? Uh -huh. Right, and five years. Well, today we have actually uh, some Filipinos, and of course you are all invited. I want, if I might say so, I would be very honored if you all go out at uh, this afternoon, 5.30, because we are going to have a candlelight vigil to uh, remember all these people who were murdered. So just outside there. Later on, we will announce it again to remind you. Um, yes, so can we have this, please? 58 dead, five years, zero justice. Relatives, this is the burial site of the 58 individuals in the most gruesome massacre to be committed in the country in recent years. It's been five years of denied justice. For some families, this merely ceremony is their only chance to visit their loved ones. The alleged perpetrators of the crime may be behind bars, but security remains volatile in Maguindanao. Days ago, a possible witness to the crime was ambushed and killed yet another hitch in the quest for long-delayed justice. 
A delegation of international journalists wants the Philippines to know that the world is watching. It's another sign that the justice system is broken. The government cannot protect witnesses in a trial as important as this, as so crucial to Filipino history as this trial, then something is wrong. And again, it's about the culture of impunity. If the government is not taking action, it is not putting in the resources to protect witnesses, then something is drastically wrong that must be addressed, and it must be addressed now. What is the status of the case? It's been it's stopped good. at the first phase. Bail petitions. Impatience among the victims' families is growing. Pero five years now, wala pa rin. Ewan na po, kung may pag-asa ba or wala ba, hindi namin alam. Kasi sa amin doon, parang yun na, 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 umabot na lang sa pork barrel, yung sa mga patahan, yun lang nila. Sa amin, wala pa rin. Parang lumala, lumala talaga ng sitwasyon. It's a defense team's turn to present evidence against more than 100... Ah, but there's another one. Ah, thank you. Um, I just want to show you, this is the fifth year, or to, this year is the fifth year, and as you can see, uh, the families are frustrated, there's no justice, so what can you say? Five years is such a long time for families who are waiting, and for families who are terrorized, for families who are being bribed to shut their mouth, but where is democracy if there's no justice? Well, it's been five years since the political massacre in the Philippines left 58 people dead. They were killed in broad daylight in the southern city of Mabundan. But no one has yet to be convicted. Channel News Asia's ILO with this report. Five years ago today, 58 people, including 32 journalists, were murdered in the southern Philippine island of Mindanao. It was the country's worst case of election-related violence, and the number of journalists who were executed still skew surveys that indicate the deadliest places in the world for reporters to operate. And still today, no one has been convicted. Yep. Okay. Now, I just want to end by reading uh, something here from an editor in one of the newspapers. Where such attacks on messengers are mounting, what can be said of life in general? Despite their fluctuating standing in society, journalists, as journalists everywhere like to say, are canaries in the mines. Journalists are like frogs in the pond. You need not love them. Absence of noise should upset us. A silent night should make us wonder what's in store tomorrow. Just as a silent town should make us wonder what has caused all the doors to be closed, all the windows to be shattered, all the streets to be empty. All over the world, many journalists have paid their lives to deliver and be the news people need to run, to fight, or at least give a damn. To ignore their lam lament is to risk being slowly boiled alive. People are killed for various reasons. No matter how those numbers are broken down, there's only one statistic that matters. That for proper prosecution, for justice rendered. And I might say that justice delayed is justice denied. Thank you. Our next session is our, our, our plenary uh, looking at snapshots of Asia Pacific uh, media freedom. Now our participants in this this morning are Ricardo Morris and Barbara Driva and we'll be looking at a number of issues affecting the the region. Uh, Ricardo is Fijian journalist, publisher, and described as fighting two battles as journalist, editor, and publisher of Republica magazine in Fiji. Sorry, Barbara's first. Sorry? Barbara's first. Sorry. Barbara's first. Go on, go on, go on. Barbara's first. Okay. Um, and he is also, of course, president of the Fijian Media Association. Our other 
participant this morning and um, our first speaker is Barbara Greger from TVNZ. Um, she's well known for her coverage of Pacific issues and well known for her dedication to bringing uh, stories from the region to um, New Zealand TV and to New Zealand audiences, something that's very important given uh, how little attention sometimes the <coughs> New Zealand media actually seems to pay to the, uh, the rest of the region. Uh, so we have about 45 minutes uh, with this, uh, including uh, time for questions. But Barbara, could I ask you to please um, take a stand and... Uh well, we're teetering on the edge of a time of great change. Never before in this modern world of fast evolving technology, human desperation and changing climate, has the media been so crucial to preserving our way of life, our values. Never before too has the media in the Pacific been so marginalised. If someone was to say to me, what do you need to be a outstanding journalist in the Pacific? I'd probably sum it up in one word, bravery. Why do we need to be brave? Because we've just seen the, uh, the, the Philippines uh, situation, the massacre there where more than 30 journalists died for basically doing their job and we don't face that. We heard that the Committee to Protect Journalists has labelled the Philippines as the second most dangerous country in the world after Iraq. <coughs> For journalists, we don't face that. But we do face violence, threats. Just last month, two workers from the National Broadcasting uh, Corporation in Papua New Guinea were raped, a journalist and a cleaner. They were on the night shift and they've been taken home. Now the attack prompted an EMTV journalist to say that media workers need to be wary of their safety, he said. We are in an industry where we expose to good and bad issues to the public. Some may like us or dislike us, and we as individuals must build a culture of security for our safety. And that's basically what they've started to do. Staff at NBC were pretty brave. They went on to strike, demanding that their employer improve their safety. Earlier this year, two newspapers faced contempt of court in Papua New Guinea for publishing the identities of asylum seekers. Transferees and staff are not meant to be identified. Now, one of the newspapers, that would be The National, apologised. The other, The Post Courier, has decided to fight the charge and their right to publish those names. Sometimes bravery costs money and um, it takes extra courage if you don't have much of it. Three years ago, the Vanuatu Daily Post Mark, editor Mark Neil Jones was attacked by a group of men. An attack allegedly organised by a cabinet minister. Not one to take this lying down, Mark took it to court, but the minister involved was in the end only fined 150 US dollars. Chicken feed, really. But the minister, I guess, he did lose some face. Mark Neil Jones is a corrupt politician's worst nightmare, packaged in the form of a publisher. He's a brave guy. In 2009, he suffered a broken nose and black eye after reporting about problems at the prison. Four police officers were charged with that one. Now, these are just two. He's been abused many times. He's irrepressible. The bravery, having bravery in you to challenge is not as easy as, as it sounds. I do recall going to the 2009 Pacific Islands Forum meeting in Cairns. A prominent Samoan journalist, who will remain nameless, loudly berated a couple of very good Fijian journalists, saying that they should stand up to the military, openly criticise and confront the interim government. Stand up to them and, and ignore any media decrees that come out. Great advice, especially when given from the security of another country. There have been many acts of bravery from my friends in Fiji. Most of them, though, aren't working as journalists anymore. There have been times when we've felt frustrated with helplessness here in New Zealand, like when a Fiji TV journo did a couple of nights in, at a jail cell after he had the audacity to send TVNZ footage without it being uh, approved by the administration. I'm not going to talk very much about Fiji, though, because we're lucky enough to have Ricardo here, who definitely knows a lot more about it than I do. 
but I would say that I hope the tide is starting to turn after the election. However, with the media industry development decree concreted in place and media, the MEDA, the Fiji Media Industry Development Authority, <coughs> yapping from the sidelines, I'd say the tide is enjoying itself far too much to consider itself turning at this stage. Um, and yes, it will come as a surprise to you all, but I am still banned. The problem with Fiji um, is that there are a good half dozen Pacific Island governments who secretly long for its draconian media laws. While most of us might fantasise about chocolate, a tropical holiday, George Clooney, some Pacific Islands Prime Ministers lie in bed at night thinking about water torture, barbed wire and all the journalists they'd like to see behind it. There are many who wish they'd beaten Baini Marama's gallop to China to pick up helpful ideas on controlling the media. <laughs> they have watched enviously as Fiji systematically put measures in place, all the while blithely ignoring international protests. Fiji's biggest Pacific critic, Samoa, has publicly slammed Fiji's media stance, with Prime Minister Tuile Epa Sailele Malia Linga Oi saying that Fiji should strengthen the media and give them freedom to do their work and not try to strangle them to death. Good words. Ironic, then, that Tuila Epa is in the process of introducing a media council bill, which will be seen as a tool to weaken media. One part of it that rings particularly alarm bells for me is that it must be, the, the bill must be applied, implemented and enforced in a manner which fully respects Samoan tradition, culture and community values. It's funny how challenging a politician can suddenly become not traditional. It's not only Samoa that trots out that line either. If only I'd been given a dollar when I lived in the Cook Islands working as a journo that it wasn't cultural for me to write about issues that they didn't want me to write about. I generally try to be respectful, but when there are questions that need answering, it's my job to get them. The Media Council Bill is a huge threat to Samoa's media and it's being welcomed with open arms by its parliament. This is what one outraged MP had to say about it. They're enjoying a freedom where they're free to report on anything they like. But the situation with media freedom here is naked, so I applaud the Prime Minister for the clothes prepared for the freedom. To add to the circus, the Prime Minister came up with an incredible claim to justify the bill, saying that media outlets were using money to collect information. And like the Murdoch News of the World scandal, illegal and corrupt means were being used to collect information. Now sometimes in Samoa it's hard enough to get a dial tone, so I'd suggest, humbly suggest, that phone hacking isn't on the agenda. <laughs> But the biggest problem that many journalists in the Pacific, including Samoa, face is themselves. So ingrained is custom, religion, village politics, and ainga, family. It can weigh heavy, especially on young journalists in particular. When I did training in Samoa, quite often a journalist would back away from a story because of family ties. Maybe an uncle is a pastor in the church that needs investigating. Or as one journalist said to me, can't do that, I'll get stoned. He's probably right. Fear of what could happen and the shame that is heaped on the reporter's family is often enough to stop a story from being written. Amongst that, though, there are many excellent journalists doing the work. The Samoa Observer, which has, to be fair, defamed many people, including myself in the past, is a brave newspaper. Its editor, Mata Afakeni Lesa, has publicly outspo been publicly outspoken, saying that media should be watchdogs of the government, not lapdogs, calling media freedom there at the moment an insidious dictatorship. Training often forms the basis of bravery. Without it, there is no platform to operate from. Disorganisation within media groups can lead to governments picking up on this weakness and moving to legislate against them. Training is essential if the media is to develop. Combined untrained journalists with low pay and a high staff turnover and regional journalism doesn't look that strong. Television news in particular is very unhealthy. I would describe it as being, with a couple of exceptions, as being in dire straits. Cost of equipment is beyond most organisations and given it doesn't last long anyway in the salt air. Take Cook Islands Television for example where the Pacific Island Forum in 2012 rolled around there, they had one camera 
to operate the news, the half hour of news. Now TVNZ donated them one, but it does show how dire their situation was and still is. Three out of four of their staff were fresh out of school, no journalism training. Now um, I'm going to do a bit of shameless self-promotion, uh, TVNZ did um, gift some equipment. There's a reason why I'm going to show this um, article. The Pacific struggle to make ends meet. Equipment and resources in short supply. This is like a museum. This is the only thing that's all we have to work with. That's why TBNZ donated equipment to a region whose need is great. First stump is Samoa, our peer broadcasting. It's an absolute privilege to give back to a region that has given us so much. That includes training the staff. Arthur Broadcasting pre records its news. So it's a nerve-breaking affair putting the entire show live to air. Oh, In the field, there's some last-minute tips. Yeah, okay, good luck. <laughs> but then, it's all action. Well, Arthur Broadcasting is about to do their very first live, but they're in something live, and so they're having to make the most of what little resources they have. <laughs> The live crew watch on anxiously, but Samuel's first live news is a huge success. I tell you, tonight was really, really good. We might just be up now with TVNZ. The celebration is well arranged. Air New Zealand's climbed on board as sponsorship, so the team keeps to Rarotonga. Cook Island's television is tiny but resourceful. Tying the transmission equipment to a piece of wood does the trick. The staff going to great lengths to get a signal, while reporter Tamari Pierre does a quick practice. Good evening, and what was this nice music? What's my name? Sorry. Sorry. The live cross is flawless, and Rarotonga is warned about a possible cyclone. Another success not shut. In Tonga, there's banks all round. You guys help us. We've been here, you know, with the equipment, and um, with the position, you know, you know it's deteriorated, which is working really well. Outside, it's all hands on deck. Hey! Then the signal comes loud and clear. I'm very happy with that. With the gear in place, the countdown to live news is on. You can hear? It's a nervous wait for reporter Rui Fotu. <laughs> but she's quietly confident, and it pays off. Thank you very much, Mr. Marlowe. For the staff, it's a chance to use new skills and provide Pacific Islanders with a service they deserve. Barbara Driver, One News. Um, the, the equipment was going to waste anyway, to be honest. Like it, we changed to digital, so it was sitting around, so why not give back? And to be fair, TVNZ has had heaps out of the Pacific, so it was a great thing. You know, resources can mean freedom in a lot of ways. I bring that up today because today in Tonga it's the um, general elections, and they're going to be using that equipment to go live. So. Um, it, it's, it's a good thing. Solomon Islands Television, they have good equipment, for example, but, um, and, and good cameramen, but their One News has been off air for some time now due to licensing issues. Fiji TV also has relatively good resources and staff, but who work under a license that has to be renewed every six months by the Attorney General. It's coming up in December. Imagine working with that axe hanging over you. And there's a lot of money tied up in Fiji television. I'd suggest that their Sky Pacific service is a heck of a lot more lucrative than the news. Several government-owned television stations around the Pacific are told when there are stories they can't <coughs> cover. The political influence in some areas is staggering. But it's the day-to-day -day challenges which are difficult. Given that most television reporters in Polynesia have to cover two to three stories every day, it's rushed and pictures are unexciting. Several stations play a dangerous game by getting one side of the story one night and then running the other side the next. Big slabs of seminars and conferences are run to the point where you're left begging for an hour with the Kardashians to discuss nail polish. I once watched a story about a road tax and 30 seconds of vision was just cars going round and round and round a roundabout. But there simply wasn't time or the motivation to get anything else. Bravery, what's that? There's no time for that in this environment. 
Like television, like radio, television has the potential to be a popular medium in the Pacific. Pictures work well for our Pacific people. The impact is huge. Imagery plus words, it's powerful stuff. Can we have um, number two, please? George Tupo V made his final journey up a road he'd travelled so many times. For some, the grief was hard to bear as they escorted their king to the last time. You know, he gave us your free life. It's hard for me to hold my tears. Because I never forget in my life. The chief undertaker, Noah, he directed his men with their burden. Their role is one weighted in tradition. A thousand men have been picked to carry the king's coffin. With such heavy and dangerous work, they have to rotate 150 at a time. And following in his late brother's footsteps, the new king, King Tupo VI, now with a lifetime of responsibility ahead of him. The military the late king loved so much led his coffin to the same tombs where his father was buried only six years ago. International dignitaries and thousands of people, the two hour ceremony was one driven by Christianity. <laughs> but in the end, it was Tongan and tradition which laid the king to rest. I think we've been able to wipe the slate clean and we've, we've laid the foundations, and I think Tom is going to move forward from here. As one life has ended, the Tongan people are now looking towards the future. Something like that takes a lot of resources and it's something that most Pacific um, stations don't have and that's why it was really good to partner up with Tonga Broadcasting um, and give them our, um, our, the use of our satellite dish and a whole lot of other stuff. It's something like that needs to be covered well. Um, while radio and print I think are in a far healthier position, television is not. And it needs to be as we face the challenges and times ahead. I think climate change is the big one, and I'm not talking about waters swamping the land. I'm talking about disasters. We're seeing more intense weather patterns around the world, and the Pacific is no exception. And when you combine cyclones with low-lying islands, you get a combination of human tragedy with financial disaster. Of course, there's no problems with getting disasters in or on the news. Disasters are like fireworks in the sky to news executives. They're easily attainable, it goes off with a huge visual impact and it's easily understood. But try selling the reason why our climate is changing, why our environment is under threat. Take the United Nations Small Island Developing States Conference in Samoa in September. It's the biggest event of its kind that the Pacific has ever seen, addressing the biggest threat to the Pacific we've ever seen and the largest number of experts in one place that we've ever seen. So which media organisation committed uh, resources to cover it? Well, TVNZ did, Radio New Zealand did and Al Jazeera did. That's it. The New Zealand print media weren't there. No Australian media were there. New Zealand media had the opportunity to hitch a ride with our Foreign Affairs Air Force. So airfares weren't an issue. Frightening, don't you think? So the packaging of developmental stories become important. How you sell the stories to your bosses to persuade them that this is an attractive story to air or write about. This becomes important. Pure information these days is not enough. It has to be a combination of fireworks and information. The media landscape today, the straps are tightening. We've seen massive budget cat cuts with the ABC. Their New Zealand office, based with TVNZ, is about to close, and it's their New Zealand office which covers the Pacific. Their Australian network is obviously ending with veteran Pacific correspondent Sean Dorney being axed. Radio Australia, which covers the Pacific, has been severely impacted. Many of their journalists laid off. 
We've seen the outsourcing of Tangata Pacifica and Māori programmes from Television New Zealand, resulting in close to 30 people getting laid off. We will still air Tangata Pacifica, but it won't be made on site anymore. New Zealand news media is under pressure. Unless you're covering entertainment, of course, it's easier to get a story about twerking on air than it is about soaring rates of child poverty in the Pacific. We're all scrabbling for the same dollar, newspaper space, airtime. I don't mind fighting for it, but I can tell you it's getting harder. Stories that cost money and resources are the first to go and that's a commercial reality. But there is hope. We have to be clever about it, upskill, change with the times, and being brave in these times is particularly important. I'm going to end on this. If I were to leave tomorrow and someone was to say to me, what's your favourite story, the story that means the most to you? Well, there's, there's been so many. I've, I've done stories that have resulted in prison time for people, changed legislation, saved lives and given family homes. They all mean something special. But the one that has always stuck in my mind the most is this one, and it's the last, the last no, one, number five. Tony Hubby's lifelight is fading, but her courage is getting stronger. The 50-year-old has terminal cancer. Sometimes I say, Mom, I'm sorry, I'm such a burden. But my mom says, my mom always reminds me that I'm not the burden, I'm a blessing. They always tell me that they get the strength from God and just save me alive. The Tongan people have taken her to their hearts, fundraising hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep her alive. She has no nobility, but today this princess got a visit from a king. And I hope I can say the right words in front of him. In fact, she sang those words in a song she composed herself. The king, never left. The king, who only ever presents a public face amidst the pomp and ceremony, found himself in tears. That's a beautiful song. We love you, people. <coughs> he made love to a visit to a commoner household, an event virtually unheard of in Tonga. But it was the king's gift of a computer which overwhelmed her. It means she'll be able to update her internet diary for her supporters. As the king took his leave, it was with the knowledge Taikami has a bigger journey to prepare for. She just turned around and said, Dad, I, I want to go to hell. And I, I didn't have anything to say after that. I thought, well, man, who am I to ask you to say? If anyone gets to heaven, Taikami will. So Tai died a week after that. The bravery of this young teen staring at death in the face was humbling and it certainly taught me a thing or two about life, about courage and what's important. Uh, good morning everyone and uh, I'm really privileged to be here and I thank uh, Dr. Robbie and the organisers for inviting me and I'm here with the two other colleagues from Fiji, Salandra Singh and Eliki and I just told Barbara that's a pretty hard act to follow, but I will try my best. Uh, I'll be speaking today in my capacity as the president of the Fijian Media Association. We've just established ourselves in June, so we're quite new. And it, it was, uh, it took a, well, probably more than eight years we've been trying to organize ourselves. So we think it's a, it's a big deal that we've finally been able to register as an industrial association. Hasn't been easy because of all the, well, the, the, the environment that the media in Fiji has operated under and all the, the bureaucracy and the red tape in trying to establish an, a, a, an industrial association. And you know, when it comes to the, the media in Fiji, things are not always easy. And up until I think it was up until uh, early this year, I was also coordinator for a few months of the Pacific Freedom Forum. Uh, that didn't really go well because I was based in Fiji and anything that came out of the Pacific Freedom Forum, whether I was responsible for it or not, I, you know, 
came under pressure for it. And uh, in October last year, the media, uh, media Industry Development Authority chairman, Ashwin Raj, called a press conference after we had uh, released the statement. And at that press conference, he said that um, journalists must choose whether they want to be advocates of media freedom or they want to be journalists. And I just thought that it was quite telling of the situation in Fiji where uh, journalists, media, media workers and editors could not advocate on behalf of their colleagues and in, on behalf of the industry. And I asked him about it to clarify. And it was, he was in you know, a roundabout way. He, he didn't really address the issue, but I, after that, I came under indirect pressure. And the pressure continued to a point where it was, uh, I, was, I was ineffective. I couldn't do much. I, even though I was coordinator, not responsible for uh, not responsible for drafting statements, I was only responsible for coordinating its uh, release. Uh, the, the Pacific Freedom Forum kept coming under pressure, so I thought it was best that I step back because uh, it was very difficult to work under those conditions. And then the implication for me, left unsaid, was that I could either run a media business in, in Fiji or I could be a media advocate. I couldn't do both. So that was before the election. Things are starting to change now, but as Barbara Riva said, that although the tide is turning, it's not fast enough. Uh, across the Pacific, not just Fiji, but across the Pacific, you know, there has been issues in the past year has been one which uh, for me has been quite challenging. I mean, if you look across the region, Barbara has covered uh, quite a few of those issues, but even in Australia, you have the, you have the national security law that last, year, last month that was put in place and that, uh, you know, commentators think would have an effect on how journalists report national security. Here in New Zealand, you have the controversy over the Dirty Politics book by Nick, uh, Nikki Hager and the, s the security questions surrounding that and also in the media. In West Papua, you've had the arrest of two French journalists and their local colleagues. Uh, earlier this year in Kiribati, you had the suspension of a, state, a journalist in the state broadcaster who, who gave an opposition MP accused of the misuse of travel, travel funds from 12 years ago a right of reply. And because he gave that MP a right of reply, he was suspended from work. And that was an issue that the Pacific Freedom Forum raised. Nauru, in January this year, increased visa fees for journalists by 3,900%, from $200 to $8,000. And this undoubtedly is to discourage journalists from traveling to Nauru to uh, visit the Australian, Australia's asylum seeker centers there. Papua New Guinea, uh, Barbara has touched on the rape of, of journal, women journalists who were home, going home from their shift at the National Broadcasting Corporation. And before that, there was an attack on a camera crew from EMTV who were reporting, uh, who were looking into a report that police had used knives to jab and poke young male youths involved in the land dispute. And then that leaves Fiji, which uh, I could probably spend the whole day, you could probably organize an entire conference on Fiji alone, but uh, we'll try to uh, limit my remarks to a few of the main points. And this year for, for Fiji has been a, cha a challenging year, but also one that has brought hope. I mean, in September we had elections and it was uh, the media authority was uh, proud of the fact that about 500 media workers and journalists from Fiji and around the world were registered to cover the election and they released that in a statement. So uh, on the face of it, the reporting of the election was, you know, was quite well uh, covered and well handled. But uh, as some of you may know, uh, there were issues with the reporting by Radio New Zealand International 
and also by Al Jazeera that uh, the chairman of the Media Industry Development Authority, Ashwin Raj, brought up at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva just recently. Uh, and during the review, that was during the review of Fiji's human rights record, uh, he brought it up as an issue in which he said that uh, uh, he used it as an example for why you know, the media needed regulating. And then he used that as an example of overseas media who are constantly, he said, constantly misinterpreting Fiji's situation. But uh, I think he's now backtrack because he used you know he, he claimed that it that their reporting radio new zealand al jazeera reporting was racist and using using such a label is uh, you know it's not it shouldn't be doing that lightly and i think he's now st stepped back from those statements to clarify especially in relation to the renzi report that uh, it wasn't it wasn't racist per se. It was something inserted here in the newsroom. It wasn't the responsibility of the journalists on the ground during the election. But, and for Fiji and for Fiji journalists, the media authority has, it has overshadowed everything we've done. I mean, if you, uh, there has been some comparisons that it, that it, uh, that Singapore has similar laws and Australia, and the media authority is always keen to point out these links. But in our case, we also have uh, penalties, financial penalties in the form of fines and also uh, prison terms. Thankfully, the, none, of the, none of the media uh, organizations in Fiji or journalists have been sanctioned under these, uh, under these rules. But I'll just give you an example of what uh, we face every day. The, the the threat hangs over you. So it's the fear of ending up on the wrong side of the media authority is very real. And so with a lot of journalists who've never, never experienced what it's like to work under free conditions, uh, just looking at the decree is enough to put them off. Uh, content regulation penalties if for violations of content regulation uh, laws, individual journalists face up to a $25,000 fine and or two years imprisonment. And for their employers, the organization, the media organization responsible, there's a potential fine of up to $100,000 for uh, breaching content regulation laws. Then there's also enforcement of media standards for breaching so, for example, search and seizure. The media authority has uh, powers to search and seize documents, whatever they require. And if you fail to comply, you uh, potentially expose yourself to a maximum of a $10,000 fine in the case of individual reporters and editors and or two years in jail. If the media authority finds you provided them with uh, misleading information, uh, you could also be fined up to $10,000 and also two years imprisonment. There's also media organizations, whatever media organization you are, even individual uh, freelance journalists are now being told that you must register and failure to register could also mean a fine of up to $10,000 or and or a imprisonment of up to two years. And because of the conditions that we operate under, a lot of uh, journalists, many of them are quite young. Some have just come out of university or uh, media course. And a lot of the violations against the media, against the media, against journalists, they don't really see it as violations. And until they talk about it quietly, you know, as we're waiting for press conferences. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of the incidents that happen that's how I find out about it. When we gathered waiting for a news conference to begin, then someone say, starts telling a story about what happened to them without realizing that that is a major violation. Um, this year alone, the beginning, the Pacific, uh, Pacific Islands Development Forum, which is a brainchild of uh, Warenga Bainimarama, our Prime Minister, had a big meeting in June this year and uh, 
Sami Sony Paretis, the editor of Islands Business, was banned from, uh, from getting accreditation. Uh, there was a uh, there was a, some publicity around that, and at the time, the Permanent Secretary for Information at the time was responsible for directly declining, uh, declining accreditation, actually directing her staff not to accredit him. And that came out, and uh, that's one of the issues, and because it was Samisoni Pareti, it got a lot of coverage, but there are many other incidents, some minor, some significant. Uh, for example, earlier this year, a journalist made a comment on her social media page about the fact that the Ministry of Health was not viewing an, a dengue epidemic that actually is uh, continuing in Fiji, but not to the, the level it was at earlier this year. and. Uh, she made a comment on social media and then the directive came from the Attorney General that she should be fired, but Fiji Times, doing the best they could, didn't fire her, but uh, transferred her to advertorials, advertising features, which is like the graveyard for any journalist. <laughs> so yeah, she, she uh, one day, uh, just out of the blue started talking about this and I had no idea that it was, it was done quite, very quietly because, you know, Fiji Times had already had several threats hanging over them. They've had fines for uh, contempt of court. So they quietly moved her to advertorials and she was telling me about, you know, how demoralized she felt and that the, that was the best they could do. Her employees couldn't really stand up for her because of the conditions that we work under. So I hope that uh, gives you a snapshot there. I see the two minute sign coming up, but yeah, I could go on and on all day, but uh, I hope that that gives you some idea of the kinds of conditions that we work under. Thank you very much. I have to say that, um, like some other people in the room, I'm, I'm an ex-USP journalism lecturer. Um, when I was teaching there, our only problem with the media was whether or not the bad we hold the material or the chance of falling with the thing. Um, I think that we've, we've had a snap. secret that uh, Manimarama has always, our Prime Minister has always uh, pointed out the contradictions that, you know, Australia and New Zealand, and he's always used that to say, well, you, you're you talking about, you know, uh, the, pro the perceived problems that we have in Fiji, but, you know, he said, you should look in your own backyard, and he's also uh, quite a few times also mentioned uh, the treatment of the uh, indigenous Australians and 
their own, uh, the Australian zone problems in their own uh, country, so it uh, has had no, I think, uh, yeah, Australia hasn't uh, really done itself any favours, and so every time they put up a statement or call on Fiji to do this or that, it's simply ignored because they say, well, it, it's meaningless. So that's the situation. Chris Nash from um, Monash University uh, in Melbourne. I have to say I've just come from the Journalism and Education Research Association um, conference in Sydney where we had an industry panel um, where there was a whole platoon strength delegation from News Limited, um, including the editor of The Australian, and there was fairly um, vigorous discussion of a decision that he'd made to uh, authorise his media um, pages editor to go undercover. She's a young, youngish woman, so she dressed down and went undercover in, as a student into a lecture at Sydney University and then reported on the left wing media bias and anti Murdoch agenda of the journalism academics um, at university. So I have to say, it is absolutely a, fresh, a breath of fresh air to come to a conference where the opening presentations are about the, uh, the links between. Um, the journalism schools and journalists in the field and the really important and pressing issues uh, that are confronting the region. So first of all, congratulations to the conference and uh, it's nice to come across the water and actually um, feel empowered and uh, invigorated. But a question then to the two speakers, how do you see from your perspective the role of the journalism schools um, and student journalists in particular in um, upholding, if you like, we're trying to develop um, principles of uh, really high quality and investigative journalism, and what would what would it be like here if the journalism schools weren't playing that role? Dire. That's how, what it would be like. Um, we rely on journalists coming out and with the ability to um, bring stories to the table, not sit there with their hands held out, which is often the case in uh, the media at the moment, waiting for a story to be delivered, an event-driven story as opposed to an issue-driven story. I think what we find with um, AET students and uh, some of the other students that are coming out, that they are more prepared to get into issue-driven stories. Um, and you can see why when you see the types of work that's being done here at AUT. We rely on that. We want them to hit the ground running. We need them to be brave. Um, we need them to challenge and we need them not to be afraid of um, Pacific stories. We have a problem in New Zealand and in Australia of a lack of Pacific stories in mainstream media. This is one way of uh, changing that. Yeah. 